Hello folks. Well, I promised you another video on Mark 1 Common Faults, Mark 1 Focus Common Faults. Uh, obviously last time we did the interior, which was quite short because there really isn't much to talk about. There's only interior issues and availability of second-hand parts that really is the killer. However, one of those uh, issues has come to fruition again. Um, the heated pad in the backrest of this seat decided to give up on me completely. Um, it was the original Ford one, and it was paired to the new one in the seat base, and they worked together for quite, you know, for quite a while. Um, unfortunately, it looks like on investigation, and if you see my YouTube short video, it's completely burnt out. Um, so I'm putting the one that I've put in the seat slab in the backrest. Uh, it's a good opportunity to do several things. I've been refurbishing the uh, seat bases because for whatever reason, uh, before I bought the car, somebody must have like submerged the car in some water because these seat bases were absolutely rotten. This one's, I, I've had a go at doing this one as well um, and stitching that up as well quite neatly. Um, they come apart quite nicely, but when you actually learn how they all go together, but... Um, yeah, so, so someone's been letting water into this car quite badly if the, the, the uh, seat bases were that bad. Um, but anyway, I will get on with the video on the um, the engine, mainly focusing on what goes on under that bonnet and a little bit of description as the different engines because people get confused between all the, the two different types of petrol engines. So uh, I'll see you in a second. Well, the eagle eye viewers of you will notice that I'm parked in a completely different position in a different time of the day. Uh, the footage I had this morning had completely disappeared, so I'm having to redo the whole thing. Um, so the main thing is that we get started on is getting into the actual engine bay, which is a bit of a problem on Mark 1s. It is a bit of a common issue. This block, for instance, they can get really gummed up and sticky and sometimes to the point where they actually get so stiff people just snap them and it's quite common for people because of how reliable these cars are have been for many years it's quite possible that the lock wouldn't have been used in quite a long time maybe once a year to at an mot for instance and they do get really gummed up i would recommend gt85 in that lock and get rid of all this gunge around here get the lock moving freely i have never had an issue with um this key the lock anything uh to do with that to be honest with you so that's a top tip you won't really have a problem if you do that don't use wd-40 it's oil based and it does stick any locksmith will tell you not to use it gt85 in that lock uh, and this is your 1.6 litre engine your ztec lump there are two family of engines um, just so for your understanding you've got the 1.4 and the 1.6 petro engines they are um, ford sigma engines which came out in 1995 in the Ford fiesta as a 1.25 litre engine uh, and later as the 1.4, 1.6 in the Ford Focus. And it stayed in production in Fiesta's Ford, the Ford Focus in particular, until around 2017. I think in 2017 you could still order a base Beck Focus Studio with one of these engines, a 1.6 litre engine. It had been slightly revised, um, like solenoid based camshaft sprockets, uh, a new inlet, but apart from that, pretty much exactly the same engine through 22 years of production why very very reliable engine there is not much you need to do at all to this engine to keep it in fine fettle and we're going to go through that in a second the 1.82 litre engine just for <coughs> excuse me just for clarification um that's a completely different engine it has a cast iron block similar in terms of dual dual um, overhead camshafts but a very different engine more so uh, made for Mondeos rather than Focuses but they were put on the Focus as like a performance engine uh, and Tefi has the 2 litre on the ST170 with a Mark 1 um, but this engine we're going to concentrate on both engines are very similar in terms of servicing so a lot will um, 
a lot of it's interchangeable what I'm going to say. Um, the main thing with these engines is you must change the oil every 12 months to spec. Every 12 months because then it stops wear and tear and general um, issues with the drivetrain. That goes for a lot of engines, to be honest with you. It can go for the majority of engines at this age, ever. But changing the oil every 12 months will solve a lot of issues. For instance, a lot of people say that these engines burn um, engine oil. That can happen if you neglect the oil changes. Skunk and dirt builds up around the piston rings and that's where you get a bit of blowback and it burns oil. If you change the oil, it's not a problem. So that's the number one thing with these engines. Secondly, make sure that they're not low on oil because these engines are not rebuildable, apparently, uh, if you run out of oil. If the big ends start knocking for any reason, usually it's low oil levels and neglect. It's a scrap engine. You need a new engine because there are no specs given to change the mains or crank bearing uh, shells. That, that is just not a, a, an option. Um, I'm sure some people have tried it, but it's just not a thing. Secondly, timing belt, okay? The timing belt, it has to be changed every 10 years or 100,000 miles as Ford stipulates. Personally, I think they only did that to impress fleet sellers, fleet buyers, I should say. <laughs> I always change this belt every six to eight years, okay? Some people say that's a bit too early, but you can't take a risk with rubber belts and plastic tensioners. And that is why a lot of these cars have gone to the scrapyard years early because people didn't change the belt and they've snapped. A lot of these cars have run on their original belts probably about 13, 14, 15 years old. Uh, some of them a little bit more low mileage, but generally these engines will run quite well on that original belt for quite a while but do you really want to take that risk no change it every six to eight years top tip um other major common problem with this engine is right underneath this inlet manifold now sometimes you may need to take the actual inlet off it's only a few bolts up in a few down here or if you've got small hands move the idle control valve so you can access this this is the third problem and that is the breather hose going onto this little PCV valve here. Make sure every so often that PCV valve it shakes and it rattles because that's the valve working. Sometimes they get gunked up and that allows breathing issues can cause the emissions to go up for the MOT. It's a bit of a easy fix that. But this hose here they can blow a hole. This hose is under excessive pressure and they can easily blow a hole and that will cause your engine to almost die, but not quite die, as I found out leaving work one day uh, when it decided to blow a hole in it. Um, they're not too hard to change. You've just got to move this valve out the way and get your hand in. Um, but that is, a, that is a, a, a quite a common problem. Always go for the genuine ones. I'll put the part number below. Um, the aftermarket ones, they don't fit correctly and they're too soft and they don't last. Get the genuine part, a nice, strong, thick rubber, and that's all you need. Um, generally, that's not a problem. Um, auto control valve, while we're, at, while we're looking at it, they can stick. They can cause uh, idle fluctuations and poor starting, or even non-starting sometimes. Just get, some, get these two bolts off, get some coil cleaner, clean it out. It's not a problem. They never really go wrong completely. I've never heard of the actual solenoid fading. It will throw a code if it does that. Um, throttle position sensor, there's not really uh, an issue with them, to be honest. Moving up here, fuel pressure regulator. They can go uh, at this age. I've seen them where they actually just leak down here. If so, it's, not, it's a simple case of replacing. You'll find it hard to get them brand new, so I go second hand. They usually don't go wrong, but sometimes they do. Um, check to make sure that these hoses have got no pinholes in. Sorry, we're having a bit of a bird fight at the moment. Uh, there's two hoses, one that goes from the throttle to the fuel pressure regulator and one that goes from the throttle all the way to the um, charcoal canister. 
uh, which is there. And to be honest with you, this never goes wrong. <coughs> um, major thing, I, I was going to talk about specific Mark 1 problems, but this is a problem faced by a lot of cars and a lot of ages. This coil pack is the newer style coil pack from Bosch. Um, there seems to be less issues with this uh, than the older style coil packs. And you'll know if it's the older style because it's got shorter legs on it. Um, they have a serious issue where they crack at the bottom and or they overheat or they just lose spark completely uh, towards the uh, plugs. Now the usual problem, well reason why that occurs is because people don't change the spark plugs. What happens is the spark plugs get old, they wear, the gap opens and that makes the coil work over time. It works too hard and that's what leads to the premature failure of the coil packs. So the advice for a long time was owners reduce the spark plug gap to one, I think one millimeter. So just to make sure that the spark is shorter and the coil packs weren't overheating. But since then, these updated coil packs, and this is a Bosch number, I will give you the part number for this. Don't go to Ford, you don't really need to. I'll give you the Bosch number. This is a Bosch unit. They make them for Ford and Ford just put their stamp on. Um, I did get all new HT leads at the same time as when I changed this. I'll put that uh, those part numbers in the description. Uh, but if you generally um, have one of these old, these newer style core packs, you can run a spark plug gap of 1.2 millimeters, no issues. And I'm running on that now, so you get a little bit more pep. And these core packs are much more stronger than the originals. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Other thing. Math sensor. You will have one of these if you have an automatic or an ST170. An automatic being either the 1.6 or 2 litre cars. You couldn't get an automatic gearbox on any other model. Um, these generally don't give any issues. You do need to clean them every so often, so take these two screws off and just put an electrical contact cleaner inside just to clean it up. Particularly as if you've ever run a K&N filter, which is oil based. If you run the paper ones, you have no problems. You just need a general clean once every probably five or six years, no problems. But if you've got an oil-based filter or had some sort of K&N or aftermarket filter, then clean it more regularly. Um, when they do go wrong on the automatics, I will tell you now, the gearbox loses complete sight of what gear it's in. So they can cause some real, real big issues. I've got a couple of second-hand spares of these. I will put the parts number in the description, but quite frankly, um, brand new from Ford, you're looking at 200 quid. Get some second-hand ones. Don't buy the aftermarket ones because they don't make the cars run properly. It may just be enough to get a car through an MOT, but you will feel the difference. If you know your car well, you will know that that is not working very well, uh, the aftermarket one, that is. If you haven't got <coughs> an SD170 or an automatic, you will have this blanked off. You will have down here, don't know if you can see, I'm just gonna aim that there. You will have a map sensor sitting right there at the end of the throttle, uh, at the end of the um, inlet manifold. Mine's blanked off because this manifold is specific to the automatics. Um, but you will have a map sensor sitting there. Now, modern cars, they have both map and map sensors. On a Mark One, you either got a map or a map, uh, a, a map or a map. Sorry, one way round. Um, but generally, they don't give any problems either. Generally, if they go wrong, it will probably produce the same symptoms that that does. <coughs> the car won't run properly; it'll probably run a bit lean or limp home, um, but it will run. But we, if you've got an automatic, I wouldn't risk it because the gearboxes really don't like it. Um, what was I also going to say? There really isn't a great deal that goes wrong. The cooling system, because this because this Sigma engine, I was going to say the 1.4, 1.6 Sigma engines, um, there it's an all aluminium engine, much lighter, much more compact. Whereas the 1.8 2 litre Zeta engine, which was the slightly older, more old school Ford engine, I would consider, with a cast iron block, and it's inlet at the back and exhaust at the front 
that can throw up the system and it can rust quite badly where it goes brown but these they don't throw up a great deal so generally if you if you see brown fur on these engines this has been really bad and neglected but generally you'll see a pink coolant bottle on these engines just check the pressure cap every so often just make sure it seals um, the hoses are not a big issue on this car I've got all my original hoses and quite frankly they are giving me no um, no issues or they're not making me think they're going to go because usually they go around the clamps um, they're absolutely fine no problems the thermostat housing if I can get my torch in yep it's just there okay they generally don't cause as much of an issue on the these Sigma engines than the 1.82 litre where it sits over here and it's a big plastic unit and they tend to crack quite easily so generally um, that is something to watch out for on them but um, not really an issue um, engine mountings this is this is a common one for going they tend to leak a load of oil around here when they go it's an oil filled one this tends to go the gearbox one doesn't cause an issue the rear one oh where's it gone now there's a rear one down there this the, the one that swings um that went on me a couple of years ago and the you basically just put it in drive and the engine would just go clunk all the way back it would really jump this one generally will cause more vibration in the cabin than anywhere else so if you've got a lot of vibration through the pedals or whatever it's usually this one this is the most expensive one and the one that makes the difference i've got an aftermarket one you can go to ford i will give you the parts number but again it's going to be an eye-watering price i can assure you this is a cortico unit i think merle and febby bilstein they make the same units um and they're all quite decent they've got a decent warranty on them and this one actually i think is just as good uh in refinement as the originals so top tip on that one I'm, I'm going to talk about the belt arrangement on this engine because this confuses a lot of people and caused some considerable disagreement on the Facebook forums. Um, this is a stretch belt. Basically, I only have a crankshaft, a water pump, um, and that's it with your alternator pulley. Because it's got no air conditioning, the air conditioning would normally sit there where the power steering is. And that power steering pump would normally sit at the back of the engine there and that would be a, a much longer belt run i've got a stretch belt and i'll put that part number in for you for whatever if, if anybody has got the same system as mine they only fitted this system from the parts catalog that i've seen from 2001 facelifted models to 2005 before they presumably got a longer belt and a tensioner where you've actually got an automatic tensioner. The tension on these stretch belts is set by when it is on the alternator. It's set by the alternator and it's really tight. They're very tight and I've never had an issue. The original Ford one lasted 17 years before it needed replacing. But basically you usually have a special tool that goes on the water pump and it winds it on. I've got a tip for you, if you've got this system, you take this bolt off, you take that bolt off, you loosen this bolt here and bring the alternator across. Oh, you'll need to take this stud out as well. Take that out and the alternator will come across because it'll be pulled by the belt. Slip the belt off, put the new belt on, and then what you're going to have to do is, it might help with having two people, is push the alternator slightly across just to line up that bolt and that bolt and you're done. It is as simple as that. It is a tough job, but honestly, it's not too much of an issue. Power steering, I'm going to put the correct fluid in the description because people get that wrong all the time. To use the correct fluid, it's the one that I've listed. People put automatic transmission fluid in. That's okay to top up in emergency, but really you need to use the green hydraulic fluid. Now, a common problem is that the power steering racks tend to fail. What they do is when you go around a the corner, they go stiff and then they go clunk. That's the rack skipping a tooth because it's just worn. And I think a lot of the problem is people don't change this. Ford don't stipulate any um, requirement to change this. 
I think you need to do so every five years or so, okay, just to make sure the fluid is good. What you do is you take this bottom hose out the bottom, put it in a bottle, top it up, and get the car off the ground, front wheels off the ground, have an assistant turn the steering backwards and forwards, and the old fluid will go straight into that bottle. Just make sure you keep topping it up. When you're done, put that hose back on, put the cap back on, you're done. It's an easy procedure. Um, generally, it's an uncluttered engine bay because I don't have air conditioning, I've got all this space here and all this extra space here. There's really, it's a really spartan engine bay. It looks absolutely fantastic. I did give it a clean ages ago, I like it to be clean. Um, generally, there's, I keep saying generally, honestly, I've got to stop saying that. It's like my buzzword. Um, there is an earth point at the back here you've got to watch out for next to the cam position sensor. Just make sure it's tight. Cam position sensor and the crank position sensor at the front down there. They can go, but they'll throw a code if they do. They're not expensive either. Um, there is a broken earth point here. Be very careful because I did that. You've got to be very delicate on these earth points. There's one here. There's another one there. Well, the one that was there is actually there. Um, there's that earth point there. There's an earth point down there. And there's a few in the car. I'll show you in another video. <coughs> uh, but there's generally... Uh, I've done it again. I've said generally... Um, there's nothing really to watch out for. These can crack these heat shields along where the, they go through the studs. I had to replace this with a second hand one. Um, the flexes, no, not really an issue to be honest with you. The aftermarket flexes are a bit thinner than the originals, but they're fine. Um, these math sensors can go, but they'll probably throw up a code and you'll fail the emissions. It's not something you can do without a code reader. Um, there is another thing um, down here. Now, if you can see where my torch is, exactly where my torch is, you've got the speed sensor. Now, on the automatics, like mine, they're not a problem. They don't really cause, they're not really a failure item as such, but they're just a wearing item, possibly. It's held in by one bolt, but if it's the manual gearbox, it's held in by a pin. You have to WD-40 and pull the pin out very carefully, and then the sensor will just fall off. Um, it tends to be more of a problem on the manual gearboxes. It is quite a common problem. So what will happen is your speedo in the car, you'll be driving at 30 and your speedo will just drop to zero. And the car thinks, oh, you've stopped when you haven't. And that's why the engine cuts out because it's not putting enough fuel through. So it's, it's again, it's the sensor lying to the computer, making it think that something's going on when it isn't. And the computer's basically doing what he thinks is right. Um, but yeah, I, I was about to say the word again. Don't say it again, Andrew. Um, rocker covers can leak, they can leak more to the back because this engine, if, as you can see, it's kind of canted backwards. The 1.82 litres sit more flat, so it's not as much of an issue on them, but rocker covers can go. You change it the time you do your timing belt, it makes sense because you've got to take your uh, tire, uh, rocker cover off to time it, put the, uh, the locking plate in to actually do the timing. Um, but there really isn't any other issues with this whatsoever. Um, just make sure these clamps are nice and tight. Really honest, there isn't. Um, I will talk just quickly about the gearbox. Gearbox, right, um, this is a four speed Ford 4F27E. It's a Mazda gearbox essentially that Ford had just slightly redesigned. Um, it's got a little bit of electronic control in the ECU. So in the ECU, you've got a little transmission controller, not sophisticated. It's not like the modern cars where they have an ECU, uh, engine ECU and a gearbox ECU. It's just one unit. It's very basic. It's very simple. Um, you've got some electronic solenoids in the sump, the six of them. Two of them are shift solenoids. They commonly pack up. They'll throw a code and you'll know it's a shift solenoid if you read the codes. Um, it's a simple case of dropping the pan, getting a service kit with a gasket, a filter and the two replacement solenoids because they're such a common item for failing. You'll know, you'll know if it is, it won't shift properly. Um, generally these gearboxes produce very little problems as long as you change the fluid. It's not, um, it's, it's not fluid for life, okay, because these cars are now over 15 years old. They've it's exceeded their expectations of their lifespan and the gearboxes do need a 
a fluid change. You can't change all the fluid because some of it will be stuck in the torque converter. You'll only be able to drain about 60%, but that's good enough. That'll be good for going on. Mix the old fluid with a new fluid. Um, changing the fluid out and flushing the automatic gearboxes can be very risky at times. Um, sometimes they actually might cease to function uh, after you've done such work because sometimes the old clutch packs were lot on friction material suspended in the old fluid to do its job. So remember that. Um, generally there's no issues. I've heard of wiring possibly breaking over the gearboxes where it gets hot, but generally no issues whatsoever. Nothing with the selector mechanism, there's absolutely nothing. Um, I will go into the gearboxes in more detail, but that's gen that, that's that's exactly what you need to know on these gearboxes. Um, that's it really. There really isn't much to say about these cars. They're incredibly reliable. Um, there might be one or two things I may have missed, but that's it really. They are incredible reliable motors. Um, any of the two different petrol engines, the diesels, you've got the TDDIs, they tend to go on forever. The TDCIs tend to throw a little few injectors out, but they're quicker and smoother and quieter. It depends which one you want. TDDIs are actually getting rare now. Um, so if, you've, if you can find one that's done less than 130,000 miles, you have got a workhorse for a long time, I can assure you. Depending on how the rest of the car is, that is, because usually the engines in these Fords, they can go on and on and on, and the bodies just sort of detonate around the engine. Um, and I'll show you just quickly what one the car should sound like. No, no, most of you are familiar with this, but um, just fire it up. There we go. Nice and smooth. That's what you want. Ticking over really nicely. <coughs> Now there's one thing that I haven't said, and that's in the manual, it says every 100,000 miles to check and adjust the valve clearances if necessary. Now there's only one reason for that. These engines are not, I don't have hydraulic lifters, they have bucket shims, and they need to be measured by a micrometer every so often and check to make sure it's the correct gap versus the valve, otherwise you'll get a bit of performance loss. I'll tell you what, don't bother. If you've changed the oil and this engine has been serviced and it runs absolutely sweet as this and drives and pulls fine, you don't need to check the valve clearances. I know a bloke who's got 170 sorry. I know a bloke who's got 170 mile an hour focus 1.6 and he's done he's had that car for about 12 years, serviced it on the dot and He's had no running issues. He checked the valve clearances recently and they were absolutely fine. This has only done 90,000 miles. So I can assume, I'll assure you, if you change the oil and service it and it runs absolutely fine and gives you no problems, it's not necessary to check the valve clearances. That is something that people kind of faff about because, oh, it's in the hands manual. I've got to do this. No, you don't. There's the official checking and then there's the unofficial way of doing things. And I'll tell you, Unofficially, you don't need to do that. It's really not necessary. Guys, I'm going to leave you there. Um, I hope you enjoyed this video. I tried to cut it a little bit shorter than my first attempt at this video, I can assure you. Um, but yep, it's running really nice and sweetly. That's exactly how it should run. You take care, guys. I'll see you soon.